is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 602. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and I'm in Seattle, by the way. Somebody said, you never say where you're at, because <laughs> I always say, joining me from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. What's up, Luis? How, how are things? Oh, things are going well. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some uh, family coming in this weekend or coming in today for the weekend uh, Ooh, for the first great. time in, you know, the years now, a year and a half, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So that is sweet for sure. That's great. Yeah, my mom actually came and uh, visited me yesterday. She lives about an hour away from me, but, you know, uh, I've got a chance to see her a few times since I got vaccinated and she did, but um, it was nice. She came down to, to my place, so that was good. So those things are starting to slowly uh, return to normal, and that's really good and hopeful for us Magic players as well for down the line. Um, this uh, This show, we're going to be doing a show titled How to Read Your Opponent's Mind. That's right. We're going to give you the tools that you need to figure out what your opponent has in their hand and in their head and what their plan is to try to beat you on the show this week. It's going to be a good one. Before we get into it, our sponsor is Channel Fireball. Make sure you check out Channel Fireball for everything you need. Of course, there seems like there's always a new set coming out. And uh, given that, if you're trying to keep up on it and get the cards in your hands, well, Channel Fireball is a great place to do it. For example, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms is the next set for Magic. It's coming out in a month. And uh, if you would like to get your pre-order going, they have the crates up over there right now. So, for example, for us mag- or, excuse me, us limited players, you can get an Adventures in the Forgotten Realms booster crate, which gives you a booster box. That's kind of the centerpiece. But you get a play mat. You get a deck box. You get a bunch of promos. You get something like, I don't know, eight or nine promos that come with it and some relic tokens too. And you can uh, pre-order those right now for one thirty four ninety nine over at Channel Fireball. So head over there to uh, get first on the list for those. And of course, the way that pre-orders work is you pre-order it. Once they're able to ship it to you, they'll get it into the mail and they'll get, they'll get it out to you just as quickly as possible. If you do end up picking up anything over at CFB, if you'd use the affiliate code LR, I'd appreciate it. It really helps us out, and it lets us know that uh, that you listen to the show and that we sent you over there, and that's uh, that's good for us, so we appreciate it. Um, also good for us, the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited resources, and it could be good for you too. There's a bunch of cool stuff that you can get uh, perks-wise over the Patreon. It's a simple setup. It's completely transparent. It is completely changeable at any time. You can drop it. You can come back. We've had people do that. You know, your life circumstances change. You're like, "Ah, I can't really do this right now, but then they get back on track. You come back. No problem at all. You can change the amount anytime. You can set your own amount when you set up and uh, it goes on a per show basis. You can also set any limits that you'd like per month. So really it's fully tailorable for you to get it exactly so that it fits where you're at uh, with, with regards to supporting your favorite creators. If we're one of them, you can check it out everything over at patreon.com slash limited resources. Now, you also get to uh, answer questions for the Patreon or ask questions for the Patreon question of the week, the question threads when we have guests, the ones that we do for our Q&A episodes that we do every set. And uh, this one comes from longtime patron Michael, who says, a question about early game sequencing. And, and this stuff is, is adjacent to what we're going to be talking about here. He says, how much value do you put on playing creatures in order to draw removal ahead of your better creatures? It, it really depends. Uh, I tend not to do too much uh, like of specifically baiting because in my experience, uh, your opponents are going to have an, enough removal. You know, like it, it, you're not getting that much out of, out of spending a long time, you know, slow rolling your good creatures, especially if they're good creatures that have a good early game effect. Cause if mm-hmm. they do at that point, I think that you're, you're much better off, uh, just using just playing at your creatures when they're going to get the most value that being said if you have two creatures that are like fairly comparable one's a little better than the other you're playing at someone who you suspect or know has a lot of removal then yeah it's not too bad to 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 maybe lead with the other one i don't put a high priority on this is the overall question or overall answer yeah the way i would describe it i'm the same as luis um you know i'm basically going to run out the best stuff sooner than later but there are interesting scenarios where it's very close and the tiebreaker can be, well, if this creature were to get killed, I'd much rather have this one survive. But a lot of times that's offset by the fact that sometimes creatures are better the sooner that you get them onto the battlefield. For example, the simplest example of that is power. 
right? If it has more power, it can do more damage over the course of the next few turns, and it may not get that many attack steps. So you might want to put out your most powerful creature first rather than trying to save it because, you know, a two mana three, two versus a two mana two, two, the three, two is going to get in for a lot more uh, ahead of time. But that can also work the other way. You know, um, think of Quandrix Apprentice or some a card like that, where if you play it out on turn two and it gets killed, it didn't do anything. But you may be able to save it where you can play it and then additionally play a spell to get a trigger from it and kind of lock in some value. And there's a lot of cards that will uh, award you for that if your hand accommodates it. But in in lieu of any of those things, just it's okay to it's okay for your creature to die, right? Your your two drop dying is okay, and uh, and there's so many times when players at the skill level that the majority of our player base is at, which is say the PTQ, GP, you know, F and M N boss, that type of level. A lot of our listeners, you know, if you listen for a while, that's kind of where we're trying to get you. Um, they play scared, right? They substitute. Basically, if you look at tier one, tier zero players, brand new players, they have no fear. They don't know what, what could happen. So they just run stuff out. But when you get to the higher levels, you start to respect the fact that often your opponent might have removal, that often, uh, you know, your creature might die. But then you don't necessarily take the further step of saying, and sometimes that's okay, right? It's okay to have your creature die. It's okay to lose a creature in combat. It's okay to, you can still win a game even if your two drop dies. And, uh, and even if it happened to be one of your better ones. So just keep that stuff in mind. Um, but like Louise said, the broad strokes is, Run it out there, especially, you know, the earlier, if it's better earlier, you're going to want to get it out there. Um, <clears throat> Luis, before we jump into our main topic, I also, I got, I got to update you. We got seven wins with the teamer deck. <laughs> which one? There's so many of them. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I forgot which one we drafted in which order, um, but I did it on my stream and th- it was with the best of one deck. So the one where you said we need to cultivate and then we snap to cultivate the next turn or the nice. next pick, that one. <laughs> And the correlation between drawing, cultivate, and winning was, it was there, but like I won plenty of games without it. Remember, this is the one that had, I think it had one duel in the whole deck. Like this isn't the one that we got the Archway Commons on. That was the first one. I haven't played that one yet. I'm going to do that on a video and put it up on the LR channel, I think. But, uh, but yeah, we got the seven wins. We, you know, there was multiple times when I had eight mana. And I had like two seven drops and two eight drops in my hand. Because if you remember, that's the one where we got the bookie monster. And we also got the um, explosive whatever. The, you know, do five explosive and do three. Explosive welcome. Yeah. yeah, explosive welcome. So anyway, there's your there's your update. So one for the good guys. And I'll see if I can get the 3-0 with the other one. And I'll, I'll let you know about that one too. All right. Are you happy? No, no. I was hoping we would, we would do poorly <laughs> with the decks. No. <laughs> Come on. You're supposed to root for me. Unless you play uh, against me in a draft, I guess. But, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get into our main topic. I just wanted to, to update that real quick because um, I know people were wondering how the decks did. Uh, how to read your opponent's mind. Um, where do we even start with uh, with how this works? I, I think a, a good way to, to start is look at when you watch other people play uh, who are skilled and mm-hmm. you're wondering like, how do they know what's in the opponent's hand? How do, or you know, or you or you're playing against someone and they play around what you have, and just trying trying to figure out like how are your opponents good at doing this, or how do, when you when you watch a streamer uh, who you know you see that you see them playing and all of a sudden they they're like yeah I'm pretty sure they have Titanic growth here, mm-hmm. and w- when you get to that spot you're, you're wondering like how how does this happen? Well, it's not just random. It's not just that oh when you become good you start knowing what's in your opponent's hands. There's actually a way to break it down, and that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to give you the tools you need to to start getting a leg up on figuring out what the uh, opposition has in their hands and why they might have that. So what are the types of information that we need to to start to put these things together? Uh, Basically, the information you need is what actions are your opponents taking because you can't get information from this unless they're giving that information, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the... and the way you get information is when your opponent makes decisions. So when your opponent makes decisions, you start getting information as to what they could be doing and why. So, so that, each that's, decision that they make is a data point for you potentially. Yeah. And you you have to be aware that your opponent makes a bunch of different kinds of decisions, some intentional, some not. And 
but they all provide data. Whenever your opponent does something, it provides data. Though actually, there's a slight uh, addendum to that, which we'll cover later. Arena also gives you information here, yes. and if you're playing on Arena, you can you can get that information. But the, the 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 best place to start is you have to know all the cards. Right. You don't need an encyclopedic knowledge of every single card or what have you, but. If you don't know what they could have, how are you going to try to predict what they do have? You, mm-hmm. you just you you just don't know. So, what you're going to want to do is be as acquainted with the cards in the set as you can. And sometimes you, they're going to make an attack or do something that you're like, "Oh, this feels like a combat trick. Let me look up what the combat tricks are." Mm-hmm. But in a lot of cases, to be really good at this, you need to be able to do this without looking it up, without yeah. you know trying to trying to to decipher what they have without knowing what's in the format, it's going to be very, very difficult. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind here as well with regards to knowing the cards in the format are the, the types of cards that you need to understand in these situations are effectively always instance or instant speedable. So that's something to keep in mind. It limits it down. And then of course you get to limit it down by the colors that your opponent's playing. So what are they actually capable of casting? And the list actually isn't as long as you think, you know, if you, for example, let's say you're playing against a red-white player, um, theoretical red-white player in uh, the format that you're playing, whatever it is, you know, go on to Scryfall. Scryfall.com is like the best, you know, uh, card image search, card uh, magic card search, and do a, an advanced search where you say, okay, I want all of the um, instant speed cards that are in red and white. And you'll notice, okay, well, there's three or four of these that are removal spells, and they may not be relevant here. There's three, two or three combat tricks. This is what they can have, right? That, that actually matters for this block, whether I decide to block or not, that type of thing. So you, it actually isn't as bad as you might think where you're just like, well, I have to know every single card. No, it really does get narrowed down um, really quickly. So don't, don't feel overwhelmed by that part uh, straight away. Well, the other thing is, look, if you're if you're sitting here listening to a magic podcast about how to get better, it, you know, you're you're already taking things fairly seriously. Right. And honestly, if you just play a lot, you you will start to pick these things up without without really that much issue. That's right. And then the one other thing to keep in mind with this is if you happen to be playing best of three, um, you will is particularly if it's game two or if there's a game three. You do have information to glean from there as well, which is what has my opponent played in the prior two games? What do I know that they have in their deck? And that can help you narrow it down too. So another big thing to keep in mind, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm actually going to recommend that you watch like uh, myself or, or, or Marshall's streams actually, because we both go pretty deep on this. This is a part of the game we really enjoy. So you you'll see us talk through this a lot. And one thing you'll notice is I don't go from I, not knowing what they have to saying, oh, they've, they've got Titanic grow, gr- growth or run amok in hand. I don't just mm-hmm. go from that to that. What, it's, it's not binary. The whole game here is trying to figure out the likelihood of any given card, not necessarily any uh, the, 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 that they exactly have that card. Like every time you get information – you adjust your percentages upwards and downwards. I don't think, and I don't think most people think of exact percentages. I don't go from like, oh, I think they've, got, you know, it's a twenty percent chance they have this to a forty percent. I just go from like, hmm, I think they've got a trick here to, oh, I, I think that they because they didn't block here. I think it's a, it's not spidery grasp to, oh, the way they attacked here makes me think it's exactly Titanic growth. Right. And you and you go from I think they have something here to oh, I'm pretty sure they have something to they definitely have something or downwards to, uh, they probably don't have anything. They just made a weird attack that one turn or what have you. Like the, it, it isn't a binary thing where you're just, you go from off to on. It's all uh, probabilities. And the, the whole game here is trying to adjust those probabilities up and down. It sounds difficult because it kind of is, but one of the good things is you'll start doing this kind of naturally. You, yeah. you won't have to spend that much time thinking about it. And the way I look at it is when they give me info, I start with like the broadest pool of what they could have possible, right? And then as they, I get more and more information, I start ruling things out, adding new things to the pool. And sometimes you get conflicting information. Like I said, your opponents don't always even know what information they're giving you. Your opponents also make mistakes or play randomly. You, know, you have to kind of factor all that in. And, you know, it, it it does adjust my probabilities. When I know I'm playing against someone very skilled, 
I know that the information they give me is intentional, and I also know that they know what they're representing and that they're unlikely to make bad plays. So it's way more useful information. When you play against like someone random who's been playing kind of sloppy, their information is actually just not worth that much to you, which in some ways makes it harder to figure out what they have because they could literally have anything. Right. And then Mm -hmm. one thing that you can do that I know some players do, including players that are like, you know, Hall of Fame players, Paul Riesel, for example. I don't write things down when my opponents play them, but you can definitely do that, which helps in future games. Or what you can do is also write down things you think they do have so you don't have to always remember everything. Not everyone's into that. So if they, you know, if they make an attack and you're like, wow, it feels like a combat trick, you could maybe have up on your screen if you're playing online, like the combat tricks in the format and just kind of keep looking over to cross-reference that alongside the new information you get and try to rule things out or rule things in. Right. And you know, that to me, that there's, there's some real meat on the bone about this, you know, confidence interval thing, right? Uh, you know, one easy way to think about this might be like t-shirt sizes, small, medium, and large, right? Rather than trying to say, I think there's a 43% chance because we, nobody has those type of numbers, you know, small percent, medium percent, you know, unlikely, somewhat likely, very likely, you know, something like that would be a good place to start. Because, you know, for me, when I look at how the progress goes, when you start getting into the more nitty gritty of it, that's where you start to get to the really high level players, right? Because like level zero players aren't aware of that your opponent really has cards or, you know, what they could be. They just sort of wait to see them and then react. And, you know, good players start to really become aware of what cards the opponent can have. But great players start to assign probability to it in at least a broad strokes way. And then, you know, I would say elite players are correct about their probabilities more than the than the good or great players are that are assigning it but aren't right a lot of the times or are too conservative consistently or too reckless you know, the, the people who are the really good ones kind of understand the probability and then also can adapt their gameplay to it properly rather than just saying, well, you could have this, so I'm not going to block, right? It's like, well, you could have this, but it's a low chance that you do. And if I block, there's a high upside. So I'll go ahead and block. You get into these, you know, more complex decision trees, but of course, these are the ones that reward you as well. And this is also where rarity comes in because, you should play around commons more than uncommons, uncommons more than rares. Rares and mythics actually kind of occupy about the same space in my mind, even though I know their mythics are less rare. But it doesn't mean you should rule out automatically assume, oh, they can't have a rare. Obviously, they're going to have some rares. But if there's a couple different cards something could be, well, you should weight it in favor of the common over the, the higher rarity cards because that mm-hmm. is more likely. Um, and that's that's somewhere where when deciding what to play around – Absent other information, and again, sometimes you have that information, I I will play around the cards kind of in order of commonality. Um, This is another big reason that why best of three can feel a lot more fun and rewarding once you've gotten really good at this. Because once you know that 10 or 13 cards from their deck, you played game one, right? Right. You, you, you You have way more information, and now you're like, well, this could be, you know, spidery grasp or titanic growth. But we just played a game and they played Titanic Growth. Well, I'm going to play around that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? that's a huge hint. Yeah. Um, what about the rewards for playing a format? Right, like you see play patterns play themselves out often with certain types of decks, particularly with commons, where like multiple cards can come together routinely, and you've kind of seen this before where it'll trigger your memory to go, oh, right, they probably have this card here because I always get destroyed by this combat trick or, you know, whatever. Um, How much do you put on, like, how much can you gain by understanding those common play patterns? Also, of note there is, you know, going back to what you just said, is like, you're talking about spidery grass versus titanic growth. Well, for whatever reason, people decide that cards are playable and other ones kind of aren't. And you might see titanic growth in every other green deck and see spidery grass one every eight green decks or something like that right so is this the type of knowledge that you're gaining by simply just playing or is that not really how you do it no that's a great point what i also not even outside just straight up rarity 
good cards I play around more often than bad cards. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes your opponent's going to get you because they'll have the, you know, whatever kind of like weird, like eh, unplayable card. I got got pretty hard by Rite of Bells Unlock in the Dominaria draft. That's the one mana, give a creature plus two, plus one, and lifelink if it's legendary. Not a card people tended to play very often. Mm -hmm. In flashback drafts, cards like that actually get played a bit more because you have a bunch of people who are kind of newer to the format. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't play around that card. And and had had it been a more played card, I might have played around it. Mm-hmm. So that definitely matters there. And then one of the thing, one of the skills of a format is just knowing the play patterns of the format. And sometimes you'll end up in spots where, you know, you, you really start to get a read on, on things. Cause let's say there's like a card that has a very specific play pattern. You'll start to get a sense of that. And when your opponent's playing that play pattern, you're like, wow, it's way more likely that they, they have this card that, you know, like radiant lightning. I'm just using another, uh, Dominaria card deals three to one creature and one to the rest of their creatures. Mm-hmm. That that card leads you to play in like a very specific way. And that's the sort of card that you could start to get more of a sense of the more you play a format. And again, at the end of the day, obviously you want to find out what they have, right? You, that The whole goal is to try to figure that out. But you're not dealing in absolutes. Uh, what's the quote? Only Siths deal in absolutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, you never know what they have in their hand until they actually cast the card or you get to see their hand. And you might be very sure they have something, there's still a percent chance they don't. And then you're trying to account for all those things. And, you know, the more skilled you get at this, the the better you're going to be do you are at doing that naturally, where the plays you make are going to take into account just the different likelihood of all the different cards they could have. And that'll lead you down the path to the play that's the statistically best play. Yeah. It, you know, another interesting learning opportunity uh, that goes along the lines of what you just said is It really is interesting if you take the time after a game has ended where you were wrong and see if you can reverse engineer why, particularly if you feel, if you felt very strongly at the time, like, you know, I've seen streamers do this before where they'll get attacked and they'll put a, they're good player, you know, so they'll put the opponent on a specific card. They'll say, oh, they've got to have Titanic growth. And then the whole entire game plays out and the opponent's hell bent at some point and there was no Titanic growth. And they played the whole game as if their opponent had it because their read was so strong. What happened there, right? Can you go back and go, oh, they attacked because they had this other thing or they thought that if their creature died, then they would get it back with this, you know, reanimation spell anyway, so they didn't care. Or in rare cases, they bluffed me. Like they just got me, right? They just sent in, didn't have anything, you know, and were just hoping I wouldn't block, right? Right. And that, that doesn't happen as often as, as you'd think, but you know, oftentimes you will put a read down and you'll feel pretty strong about it and you'll be wrong. But if you can manage this, this comes up a lot in live play where you can just ask the person, you know, like, Hey, can I talk about that? Yeah. So you attacked with this three, three into my four, four, I didn't block. Was that a bluff? Like, did you just get me or what? And, And they might, and then they'll explain their, They'll say like, oh, I thought my creature had first strike. And you're like, oh, okay. You know, or they'll say, well, I had this spell that brings back two creatures from the yard anyway. So I figured if my creature died, it wouldn't matter. And I could use my mana on that. You know, that type of thing happens all the time. And each time that you get to go down that logical road, you can start to sort out for yourself. What are maybe my weaknesses with this? Like, was my read too strong? Should I have bumped it down from a large t-shirt size to a medium? And played accordingly, right? Because there are precious few times when you get to find out, right? A lot of games, you won't ever really know whether you were correct or not, you know? And if you can track those and, and look back at them after you're done, it'll it'll hone that skill for sure. That's why it's always important to look at the quality of the information you have. W- mm. When your opponent attacks uh, a 2-2 two, two into a 3-3, three, three, that, that's pretty high quality information because they're costing themselves a lot there. And it either means they've got something or they're bluffing. And mm-hmm. bluffing is definitely part of the range here. But, you know, most people really don't bluff that often. They really don't. The number of people that attack 2-2s two into 3-3s three is extremely small. So right. when my opponent attacks a 2-2 two two into a 3-3, three three, now I'm like, okay, they've got something. Right. And when the question attack, is what? Right. But when they attack a 3-3 three three into 2-2s, two two twos, they don't necessarily have something. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is generally not considered a favorable attack. Right. You double block that three three. They they now trade it down. Mm-hmm. But if they did that and then they didn't have anything, I wouldn't be shocked. That that is in in a lot of ways lower quality information than when they make a chump attack. 
And so you just, so yes, I've definitely done this myself or seen people do it where like you, you just have the read that they have a certain thing and you don't go back and reevaluate that when you get new information and then they end up not having it. And you're just like, wait, I was so sure. Why was I so sure? And you just have to get better at doing that. Cause that, that's really ultimately when they do make an attack that makes sense, that doesn't make sense versus an attack that's slightly unfavorable versus an attack that actually they didn't have to have anything to have to make that attack. And you have in each of those sends you a different signal kind of got to compare them all and see where you end up at the end there. So it's not static though, right? So you, let's say no. your opponent does this, you decide they have something, you have a vague guess at what it could be, say a combat trick. I'm medium t-shirt size on it. I think they have one, but I'm not like a hundred percent. What are the types of information that you get that would change that? It really just depends like an opportunity for them to use it when it would be good and then they don't use it is a mm. signal, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you you think that they might have a plus three, plus three trick. And then at some point you're, you're like, well, you know, if they have it, they have it. Or like, I, I don't really have a choice here. And you, you know, m make a block where the, if they had a three, three trick, it would actually work really well, but they don't use it. The percent that they have that trick goes down a pretty good amount. Yeah. But it might open the door to now think, oh, maybe they only have a plus two, plus two trick because mm. that wouldn't have been as good there or a plus one, plus one trick or or just something else. You know, it's not all just combat tricks. You know, as we're going to mention later when we, we talk about, uh, you know, suspicious attacks and whatnot, when your opponent attacks a two, two into a four, four, they could have a plus three, plus three or a plus two in first strike or whatever, but they could also have a sorcery speed deal too. And mm -hmm. then that's part of the range too. So then later, if you attack a 4-4 into a 2-2 and they don't block, you might start to think, oh, maybe they actually had a sorcery there. It wasn't this common plus three, plus three trick that I thought they might have had earlier. So yeah. I'm looking not only for places where, you know, that, uh, you know, kind of attacks they make that, that demonstrate the trick. I'm also looking for places where they don't use it that, where it would have been good because that's definitely a place that you can look at and start to, to adjust probabilities as a result. Yeah, you know, a, a good example for something like that, that's it's similar to the first one that you gave, but it's very, very telling, right? Is they attack their 3 3 into your 4 4. You say, eh, you probably have a combat trick, I'll take it. You untap and you draw a, a card that does three damage to a creature, right? And you say, well, I'll burn their creature now. They'll probably use the combat trick that I think they have. That's a one for one, but now they can't attack me anymore because I got it out of their hand and I have my four four here. So you fire it off and they go, cool, resolves and bin their creature. Hmm. Right. Now a reevaluation is in order because that would have been a really good time for them to use the combat trick to save their creature potentially. Right. And so, you know, now you have to start wondering, well, would they have? And then, you know, you kind of have to uh, gauge things according to the skill level of your opponent, as you mentioned which gets complicated, but, um, but yeah, you know, these little moments do pop up where it starts to become clear that the initial gut check that you had might not be correct, but that that doesn't mean that they have nothing, right? It's very, very rare. Like we said, bluffing is pretty rare and it's very rare for people to just make reckless attacks and stuff like that because most of the time people block. I mean, that that's the fact is that, you know, and we'll probably touch on this, but I mean, a lot of times it's, it's correct for you to say, I think my opponent has a combat trick and I'm going to let them use it as a removal spell here anyway for, for reasons, you know? So if that's the case, it makes bluffing quite difficult. But, uh, many times if, if one of these plays happens early, it can be useful to jot it down as a, as an idea and maybe even hold yourself to a not that likely, pretty likely, very likely type scenario and then see how close you were, uh, when you get the information. Because if it's early in the game, usually you will actually end up finding out whether they had it or not. So. so so, questions you always want to be asking yourself is like, how much do you want to adjust things based on your opponent drawing new cards or seeing new cards? Because that's part of magic too, is your opponent's going to see new cards. So what was true two turns ago may just not be true anymore, both mm -hmm. in they might have more options, but also the, the board state has changed and the game has changed so that you, you'll end up in a spot where you just have to readjust you know, what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. And then when do you decide one of your reads is wrong? And and that's another key part is you put them on a card, an opportunity came up where they didn't use the card. Another opportunity came up at that point. One missed opportunity is enough for me to downgrade a card's likelihood by a lot. Yep. 
two missed opportunities. At that point, I'm thinking, oh, maybe they don't actually have this card. Right. So, so you you do have to be aware that again, it's all just a sliding scale. It's very rare it goes down to zero unless they again have no cards in hand, and it's very rare it goes up to 100 unless they actually play the card. The the key is just setting yourself up best for what is the most likely. So um, when when it comes to this drawing a card thing, you know my inclination is to uh, mostly ignore it. And what I mean by that is, let's say we have a precarious board state, right? One where I'm doing something that I can do once every turn, but if my opponent has the right type of card, they can disrupt it and swing the game in their favor. I do the thing. It works. Okay, so my opponent doesn't have the thing that they need to stop me from doing it, whether it's an attack step or an activation of a thing or whatever, right? So now my game plan is keep doing the thing, right? Because it's getting me an advantage over time. But if there's a risk to doing it, meaning I can not do anything and maintain, or I can do the thing and start to win, if I do the thing and I start winning, well, the only thing that's changing right now is my opponent's drawing a card. So should I continue to do the thing and continue to try to keep winning, or should I stop, right? And my inclination is to keep doing the thing because, well, for starters, 40% of your opponent's deck are lands most of the time. So those, generally speaking, aren't going to change the equation. And then... If you lay out their entire rest of their spells remaining, how many of them actually interact with the thing that I'm doing? If it's some type of removal spell of any sort, it's probably going to be between zero and, say, four or five or something at the most, right? And if that's the case, I'll take my chances, right? They've probably got 20-something cards left in their library. If only, say, two or three of them on average actually matter, well, I'm going to keep doing the thing. Is that a sound approach to this, Luis? Mostly what I'm interested in figuring out is what they have in their hand. Mm -hmm. So when they draw new cards, it makes it like more likely, but it doesn't make it less likely. So Mm -hmm. I I tend not to worry too much about draw steps because you can't control those things. Right. So I I, I generally agree with your approach. Like I'm going to spend my game trying to figure out as best I can what they have and play around it. I'm not going to factor too much in like, oh, well, what if they top deck something else this turn? It's like, well, if they did, they did. But I I don't have information that's going to show me that. So I would much rather play around what I have information on rather than the unknown they could have drawn. Okay. So you don't want to use a draw step as a data point. That's not how how it works. But instead, how they act, what they do, what they change with their play patterns, because I mean, that's actual information. The draw step's not worth zero, but it's not mm-hmm. something I'm going to spend a lot of energy worrying about because you can't okay. control it. Yeah, because this reminds me of, you know, we've talked about this before. Maybe it'll come up in this conversation, maybe not. But, you know, there's that kind of sliding risk scale, right? If you're super, super, super far ahead in a game, um, you can really afford to play pretty conservatively. If you're way behind, you can't, right? You have to take risks that make you uncomfortable Definitely. and risks that you don't want to do. And, uh, you know, maybe that's the level that we're talking about here where, you know, of course, if you're behind a draw step isn't going to change, but if you're super far ahead and you could think of a card in the format that could actually mess you up, you know, then you could maybe afford to play around it. But at that point, you're getting to such edge cases. These aren't the the routine plays that we make in a, in a normal game of magic. <clears throat> So let, let's let's start looking at the places uh, where you can get information. So and how and what information we can get from these different things. Uh, okay. The first the first place is when your opponent does anything. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes. Any game and, and, action. <laughs> or, or in the case uh, of arena or even live tells, which we're not really going to get into, out of game actions. Uh, but mm-hmm. yeah, whenever your opponent makes a decision, you get information and. We're going to go narrow it down much more than that, of course, but you have to keep in mind that this is the game of magic. You know, this is such a big part of the game is what is my opponent doing and what does it mean? And the what does it mean part is what we're trying to drill into. The The biggest data points you get is when they do something weird, you know, because mm-hmm. when your opponent plays like kind of normally, like they attack creatures into similar sized creatures, uh, they don't chump block, they, you know, they, they make trades when you know, they're, they're behind in life or when you offer like a trade, a trade down, right. When you're like, well, you know, I, I have a reason for this and no, you're, you're giving information there. This is why we're doing this, but I'm okay attacking a three, one into a one, one, because I have like a diabolic edict effect. That's going to make them sack a creature. So that, mm-hmm. that'll make that better, you know, and, and, and they take that block, all that's normal stuff. And you're not going to get you know, you're not going to jump out of your seat when they do when they do like normal plays because you're going to understand 
hey, you know, this is kind of like the normal things. We're not getting much information besides the fact that my opponent is competent. But when they do something that kind of that's outside the norm, that's where you really st- get to start picking up information. And that's what you should be focusing on. So let's talk about some of the places where you should really be paying attention because this is where, where the meat of it is. Uh, okay. One of the big ones really is is thinking pauses. Mm. When does your opponent stop to think? And this is like so level one, but honestly, so much of winning at Magic, even at the high levels, is just doing the level one stuff well. Yeah. Like, you, yes, you know, get, getting you the, the last 5%, the last 10%, the last 15%, you know, successively takes, uh, you know, more advanced tactics and a lot of extra practice and really just, you know, honing your craft. Getting the first like 85% is just like, can you play level one correctly? Because <laughs> mm-hmm. a lot of people just can't do that. And it, it's a hard game to play. I, I, you know, I make mistakes every single game I play. There's a reason that that just playing correctly gets you a lot of win percentage. And most people will think when it's time for them to make a decision. So what does that mean? Well, you cast a creature and they start thinking, I adjust the likelihood of them having a counterspell up a pretty good amount. Yep. Because if that creature doesn't have an entered a battlefield ability, if it's just straight, I'm playing a four mana, four, three, and they're thinking, well, what could they be thinking about that matters at this time? Oh, it's whether to counter the creature. There's just mm-hmm. not that much else. There are some exceptions, of course, like, oh, they might have an instant speed diabolic edict effect so if this is worse than the creatures I have in play, maybe they'll cast that in response. But you'll find that out pretty quickly most of the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just when you play a spell, they think the, if A, there's nothing that will happen in response, and and B, they're playing a, ca- a color that could have counters, which mostly means blue, that's a, a good time to, to put them on counter spells. Mm-hmm. Of course, sometimes, you know, creatures and spells have a, effects when they resolve, they could just be thinking about those. So just keep that in mind too. But the, the classic thinking when you have a counter spell in hand, you know, hasn't gone away. Yep. Uh, they think after, uh, after blocks are declared. So, you, you know, you, you, they attack, you block and they think, well, they're the ones with priority. So if they have something here, then they're more likely to play it there than not. Of course, there's reasons not to play a combat trick. Even when you have priority and all that, but this is a this is a time when if they're thinking that probably means they have something to do because most people don't want to spend time thinking unless they have something to do. And now advanced players, of course, are going to try to trick you and they're going to spend their time, you know, thinking su- such that to try to fool you and think about things at times when they have nothing. And, and those are just classic behaviors. But a lot of the time when your opponent's thinking about something, you can assume that they've got something. Uh, note that <laughs> it's it's a little less likely for them to. Uh, to attempt to think after they block because the kind of the pressures on them if they make a bad block, but if they made attacks uh, they and, and then they start to think it's usually, it usually means that they've got something going on. Okay. So that's level one. Yeah. So level one is just when your opponent thinks, think about what they could be thinking about mm-hmm. <laughs> convoluted sentence. But the reality is when they're spending time thinking, it's probably because they have a decision and sometimes there's not that many different decisions they could have at a certain point. So I assume they have something that, that interacts with one of those decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one is when your opponent makes a disadvantageous attack, when they attack in a way that's weird, there's a good chance they have something that makes the attack good. You know, and, and of course the underpinning to all this is you're going to play against people who just make bad plays and, the more bad plays they make, the more you'll learn not to trust the information they're giving you because you start to realize they're just making plays. But the good news about that is if they make a lot of bad plays, you're probably just going to naturally win too. So it's not not something you have to stress too much about. Right. But when your opponent you know, uh, makes an attack that does not look good for them, well, the odds are they probably have something. And once again, just to reiterate, less true on blocks because if they make a bad block – you can just pass and then they have to do something. But when they make an attack, you have to then make the decision to block. At that point, you can't get out of the trick. Right. So it's so when, the, when your opponent makes a, an attack that seems odd, think about the following. Think about combat tricks, of course. You know What kind of stats do they give you? Think about what they didn't attack with. If they attack a pair of 2-2s two into your 4-4, four four, but they don't attack their 1-2, they might have like a plus three plus three trick because then that'll let them win the win the combat. Um, uh, sorry, if they, if they have a two twos and they don't attack with their one one, they might have a plus three plus three trick, or right. they might have a three damage spell or a two damage spell. Wh- whatever the numbers are that make it so some creatures want to attack and some don't, that difference between what's attacking and what isn't can often be telling. Mm-hmm. And you know, 
Also, uh, think about damage spells because sometimes they attack a creature, a small creature, into a big one because they have a, a damage spell that they can kind of use to bridge the gap. The other thing is post combat plays because it's not all combat tricks, and sometimes they have a deal one to everything. So they're like, "Oh, I'm going to attack my pair of, of two ones into your three threes because I have a deal one to everything." Note that I left my two three back. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, or and, and think about like mass pump effects too, like. When there's a common plus one, plus one to all your creatures in the format, if they make a bunch of attacks where it lines up so cleanly that you can all block one bigger on everything, maybe switch that around right? so that uh, so that it doesn't quite blow you up. And then think about things like, you know, like edicts are a big one. If they if they make a if they offer a trade that looks kind of bad for them, well, think, whoa, what, what if they have the uncommon that makes me sack a creature and this, you know, trading down their four two for my two one. Looks doesn't look great, but then then I have to sack my six six flyer as my only other creature in play. Right, and you know I want to mention this because each of these, the combat tricks, the damage spells, the post combat plays, these are things that are triggered by a weird action from your opponent, right? Something that doesn't stand out, and this is a skill that you can also develop, right? If you watch people that play a lot, you'll see them pause or even ver- go, "What? Like, what is this play? Like, this doesn't." This doesn't click for me, right? Because there's a lot of magic, especially in the early turns, that's kind of like, okay, they're going to offer a trade. Okay, I'll block. Or, you know, they have a bigger creature. They're going to attack with it. I'll I'll take it. You know, this kind of stuff that just sort of becomes commonplace. But then sometimes somebody disrupts that and you go, huh? And that is a good – that means you're getting data, right? As long as you recognize that this attack is weird, different, that it doesn't really make sense, that something's going on here is when you can turn that on. And for me – I always think of these moments as, you know, that sound from Metal Gear <laughs> that like when you walk around a corner and you see a yeah, guard and it goes, yeah, yeah. it goes, Dring. you know, I always, that sound goes in my head where I'm like, there's like an exclamation point over my head and I'm going, wait a second, right? Like not, you know, some of them are very obvious, like what Luis said, you know, attacking a two, two into a five, five or something. It's like, wait, what that, what is going on here? Right. It makes you ask that, but there's also those weird ones where they have four creatures and Three of them are attacking, but that two three is left back. And it's like, what is going on here? Right. And a lot of time, if you take that moment, you know, we call those like inflection points, right? Like that's a moment that actually matters in your game where you can try to drill down and get a decent idea of what's going on. Or maybe they have a card that you don't see very often. And this is the time when you can actually get the read and block or live. The ones that come up the most are the ones that you mentioned last to me. Um, as those moments when you can really pick up on it, which is if there's a mass pump spell, um, where if you make the obvious blocks, you get blown out across the board. But if you don't, you can mitigate it, use your life total as a resource, but really make that mass pump spell not like a sweeper for them, you know, on their side. And also spells that have global effects on creatures. Like every creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. This does one damage to each, every creature on the board. Those are the ones that if you can remember that they exist and then apply them to those weird multi-creature attacks, but one stayed home and like what is going on here, you can often go, oh, I see what you're doing. You're going to give everything plus two, plus one. I'm going to block normal and get blown out. Uh Uh-uh. I'm going to double block here, double block here, and I'm going to let these other three through because it's not lethal. Right. And we're going to see what you do then. And you'll often get the reverse pause when you do that. If you block correctly in those scenarios, people just go, how did you like, why did you block like that? You were just supposed to line up every creature in a row so I could mow them right down. But the key here, right, is that you are actively recognizing that Metal Gear moment and then turning your brain into a thinking moment where you actually try to figure out what's going on rather than the more lazy line, which I've done many times, which they go, well, that's a weird attack block block. What do you have? Right. You can do better than that. This is a moment where it's, you should actually use some rope and, and try to figure out what's going on. I mean, and I want to note when your opponent is making the like normal or unsurprising plays, that mm-hmm. doesn't mean they're not giving you information, mm. but what, when they make a play that sets off your 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 alarm bells, that's when you that's when this really comes into play. It's it's the, the, it was a good example mentioning the the Metal Gear like alert noise because when your opponent's just making plays that don't stand out, you know you, you're you're picking up info as as the game goes along. You're trying to figure out what's happening, but 
when they make something that's like really weird, like, oh, something's definitely up here. This is, you know, I, I need to I need to make a play to, that accounts for that. So right. a, a great example. And, uh, you know, that that goes goes on to, to a broader category, which is when your opponent makes some makes a strange play. That's when you should be on high alert. And there's a lot of different ones. We can't cover all of them. But like, you know, your opponent kills a 2-2 flyer instead of a 4-4. What do you think? Just think about the conclusions. Because normally a 4-4 is worth more than a 2-2, right? Especially if the Mm -hmm. board's relatively empty. Well, maybe they have a 3-2 flyer that has to hit you, right? There's an uncommon flyer that when it damages you, it does something really good. So they want to clear the path. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe they have a spell. There's a a rare that deals 5 to all creatures without flying. That's mm-hmm. definitely a, a, the kind of card that I would be thinking of if they killed, you know, they used a, a, an unconditional kill spell on my 2-2 two, two over my 4-4. Four, four. Just try to go through the, what would make – basically, I assume my opponents all are fairly competent unless they really prove me up, prove it otherwise to me, right? Mm-hmm. Whenever they make a play that doesn't make sense to me, I try to think what are the cards that they could have that would make this play make sense or good? Mm-hmm. Well – this play looks really good if you're if next turn you're playing and killing all creatures without flying, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, this play looks really good if they've got a spell that kills a creature with power four or greater. And so they right. wanted to use one spell on the two-two and then that spell on the four-four. And as long as I can think of those cards, I just kind of keep going. And once I've drawn when I, once I, I you know run out of those cards, now I think, okay, I think they probably have one of those cards. Let's say it's four cards. As they make more plays, I try to say, oh. You know, they really would have played this one if they had it or yep. uh, th- this the way they played last turn makes it almost impossible for them to have this card. Now we're down to two cards like you can get a ton of info you really when can. your opponent when your opponents make these kinds of plays. And you just have to keep that in mind because you're you're really going to you know, it's going to pay dividends when you get that information. Yeah. You know, and sometimes you can be really confident, too. Like, let's let's go with that scenario that Luis described where your opponent kills your two two flyer, leaves your four four. You narrow it down to four cards. One of them is a sweeper that does five damage to each creature. The next turn, your opponent plays a 5-5 on the board, on the ground, right? You're like, okay, I'm eliminating that, right? Like, there's just no way that, like, they had a perfect opportunity to sweep the board here and then follow up with a 5-5, and instead they played it onto the board. The chances that their game plan revolves around resolving the sweeper seem very low, you know, based on what I was thinking. So now I'm going to look to the other cards that are on the list, right? And so, you know, these are ways that you can effectively eliminate cards from there to try to narrow it down as much as possible. Well, speaking of sweepers, uh, sweepers are actually one of the biggest category of cards that A, reward you for playing around them because sweepers go from like, it's not often that you have a mediocre sweeper. They're very frequently incredibly good yeah. or they're or they're not good. There's not that many times when you're like, oh, I got a two for one on this. It's usually like, wow, they four for one me or it's like, oh, they, they had a sweeper but it didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the sweet sweepers give off some weird vibes. Uh, one is your opponent's not playing creatures. Well, if they're not playing very many creatures, most limited decks have a lot of creatures. And if they're just not doing anything, that's a huge tell. It's one of the biggest. Uh Turn Another four, tell- if they go land go and they have six or seven cards in their hand and they haven't played a creature yet, something's up. Yeah. If they then cast a, a four mana card draw spell at the end of your turn, I I think it's a little less likely. But still, when True. they don't when they don't use their mana on like turn four, that's a huge tell that something weird is going on. Uh, and often that answer is a sweeper, uh, chumping at high life totals. Right. Oh if, yeah, the classic. You att- and this is actually a one of the 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 reasons that. You know, many times I've made the play where my opponent attacks me with a like a four four. The turn before, I'm probably going to play a sweeper, and I choose not to chump with a two two because that's just such a weird play at like sixteen health. Yeah. That I, at this point, I'm not going to make that play out of the hope that my opponent will play an additional card. Because if I if if you chump there, almost any opponent who knows what's going on is just not going to play another creature into the board. Like right. it would just make no sense. And then. Similar is if they're doing things other than playing creatures and taking a bunch of damage while doing so early, it's not quite as suspicious as when they just do literally nothing, Mm -hmm. but it's still kind of suspicious if they're developing their board with non-creature spells 
or, or like, you know, enchantments or, or casting card draw and just taking damage. Like that's just not the normal thing it's to play. On your so, radar, yeah. so really keep an eye on that. The funniest tell, by the way, Luis, right, is they have four one ones. You have three four fours and they go, OK, attack with all. <laughs> and you're like, yes, the problem with this read is that you now can tell that you're about to get swept here, but you can't do anything about, you know, the information's not great. Right. It does mean that you should probably block. And in fact, uh, mm-hmm. the, 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 the more interesting example there is when they attack with like a 3-3 three, three and you've got a 2-2, two, two, but the, you, the board's massively in your favor. Do you just chump there? Sometimes right. you chump there. Some people like, do. Yeah. If they, if they don't have a sweeper there, then they're just so dead that this, that's all that this could be. Yeah. The only time that you need to really watch out there are – like in the scenario I gave, if there's a sweeper in the set that does three to all creatures or something right. and they're just desperation moding, you know, uh, yeah. Anyway, but that that's just one of those funny situations that comes up around sweepers. Uh, so let, let's talk about Arena because uh, the way yes. a lot of people play Magic these days is on Arena. And Arena adds another layer to this. Remember I said it's not just the in-game decisions. It's also kind of the like metagame stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, Arena gives you a ton of metagame information which has to do with the auto pass. So if you don't play arena or you do, and you hadn't heard about talk this uh, way about it, auto passing is when arena sees you can't do anything. They don't even give you priority. And the reason they do that uh, is because it makes for a much smoother online experience. It's a lot more fun not to be asked. Okay. Are you, you know, do you have a response when you don't have any responses? <laughs> right. You know, you, mo- most, most people aren't interested in doing that. And as a result, if your opponent has one red mana, like one mountain, and they're getting priority, like during your turn, they have a spell that costs one red. Now, yep. before we go, I do want to mention or go further. I do want to mention that you can go, you can play on full control, or you can set stops on your opponent's turn to like bluff this to like get priority. There's no way to bluff auto passing. Like, there's no way to to hit okay fast enough to not show to 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 conceal that you had priority. Like, mm-hmm. if your opponent's paying attention, they'll always see when you have priority. So there's no way to to bluff the other way, but you can make it so you always have priority, so your opponent doesn't get information about auto passing. Mm-hmm. But no one plays this way. Nobody like, does this. Yeah, I I never play this way. The only times I have ever done this are literally when I'm playing in like one of the rivals league weekend events, and it's a high leverage situation. Yep. But. I have never played on stream or during drafts, random drafts or whatever with full control on. So I, so I give you less information. I think it's just not good value in terms of how much fun I'm having with the program and how much time it takes, but mm-hmm. be aware that people could do that. I just don't see it as being very likely. So that said, arena gives you some good info in a bunch of places. Uh, the example before when they only have one red mana up, that's perfect because the less you know, mana they have access to, the much, much smaller the card pool gets that they could have. When you've got one red mana up in in uh, Strixhaven, it's like what? Shock, Academic Dispute, Infuriate, and that's it. Lightning Bolt. You know, mm-hmm. Lightning Bolt, right. Mm-hmm. So, and, and right there, the fact that I didn't even mention it is a good sign that Lightning Bolt's not a very loud card because it's a, it's a rare. It's, right. not, it's, not, it's not one that shows up that often. The more mana they have up, the wider the pool gets, and eventually it gets wide enough that all you can tell is, well, they've got some kind of instant. Yep. You know, yep. but they have seven mana. It could be a lot of different things. Uh, one of the most obvious and most useful tells is they don't have priority on, on your turn, right? Like you go to attack and it just automatically goes to attacks. They have nothing. Then you put a spell in the stack. All of a sudden they have priority. <laughs> Guess what? They've got a counter spell. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you might think, well, now they're now that now that you know they have a counter spell, it's too late. But that's definitely not true. One of the best examples I have of this actually just happened was uh, I was drafting Dominaria. Mm-hmm. I cast a spell. My opponent had one island untapped. They got priority. I'm like, oh, they have a syncopate. Uh-huh. That's the blue X counter target spell. Totally. And it just wrecked them because the rest of the game, I just knew they had syncopate. And at some point, I let oh. them have it. I walked a spell into it. They they did they did have the syncopate. And it, but I just knew about it, so I never played a good spell into it. When they tapped out, I played a good spell, and they must have like if they didn't realize the arena tell thing, which yeah. I don't think they did, by the way, because at one point I made them discard two cards, and they chose to keep syncopate in hand. Oh wow! Which they would not do if they knew it was face up. But it must be kind of frustrating, right? Like you're like, wow, mm-hmm. I keep my man up for two turns, and they don't play anything into it. Then I tap out, and they slam a five drop. Right. And it's like, yeah, that's because on turn one you played island, and this leads me to. Uh, a way to, to to get around this. Make sure you know which lands you're playing because that can conceal information. Yeah. Uh, 
if I have academic dispute in my hand and I know I'm going to want to play it later in the game, like I know I've, I've already got, let's say, uh, a, a lore hold pledge made, right? The 2-2 two -two that gets plus and plus O in first strike mm -hmm. uh, when you play or 2-2 two -two first strike that gets plus and plus O when you play a spell. I already know I want to combine that with academic dispute, right? Mm -hmm. I don't play a mountain turn one. I play a planes because that way if they play a one drop, it doesn't give me priority and then therefore reveal that I have an instant that costs one red mana in my hand. That's right. Uh, likewise, if you've got a spell in your hand that you can't cast yet, but you're going to play the land to be able to cast it this turn. So like, let's go back to academic dispute. Let's say I had two planes and a two, two in play. If I'm not going to need that mana during combat, I'm going to attack with my two, two, then play my mountain and play my lore hold pledge mage. Because if I play the mountain first and attack all of a sudden I'm getting priority during combat. Cause I have an instant I can play and I don't want to show them that. So I don't play my land until after combat. And these are ways you can conceal kind of what's going on. Yeah, you know, um, a, an interesting example for that in Strixhaven also are the uh, activated abilities count for it too, right? So, you know, let's say that you have the academic dispute of the bolt or whatever, but you play an island first. You say go, it doesn't stop your priority, it comes back, then you play the mountain. Well, if it stops you there, your opponent has to be aware that you could just have elemental masterpiece or any number of the cards that you can pay to to discard, right? And Because that stops you too, right? Yeah, so now your your lightning bolt or your dispute or whatever is concealed Definitely. under a and bigger um, you know umbrella of cards so that they can't really play around. They can't get that specific anymore. <laughs> I, I have gone so far as to tap my mana in, in a way that doesn't look completely unnatural, but tap my mana such that I can't cast the spell at hand so it doesn't show that I have the ability oh, funny. to cast the spell. That's funny. <laughs> and, and, that and when you Yeah, no, when you're pretty sure that 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 you're not going to need to cast a spell. That's 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 the way to go about it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, another arena tell is, um, the, you know, you don't have priority. They don't have priority before you attack. But then once your creatures are attacking, all of a sudden they have priority. Well, that that means that they've got you know a, a spell that interacts with tapped creatures or attacking creatures, and, and you need to keep that in mind. Right, so, right. it, using arena tells even more than anything else really rewards you for knowing what's in the format because you can draw all these lines because every time they get priority when they didn't have it that's that's the most jarring is when they didn't have it and then all of a sudden they do yes it helps you narrow down things tremendously and that this is part of the game i i, I people can do whatever feels right to them i i generally have not found it to be worth worth it putting on control like i mentioned to, to conceal these things but there's a lot of information here and if you really want to win a match that is one way to give yourself a little bit of an extra edge if if you consider it worth it you do right i consider it worth it yeah it's like free ish right i mean this doesn't take like a huge amount of extra effort or time to, to take advantage I of those timing tells right oh I always look for the timing tells. I don't try to conceal them with full control. That that I don't like to do. Same, but, yeah. But but no, I this is part of the game for me. It, it's just like on Magic Online when my opponent runs out of time and loses the match. I don't like. I tend not to like take a bunch of actions to try to time them out. But mm -hmm. I do consider it part of the game when someone when someone timed out in arena on like you know in the last pro tour or whatever. I don't really feel bad for them. Like that is part of the game, and likewise. These arena tells are just part of the program and the and what you're playing on. So, yeah, I don't I don't really uh, I don't think it's in any way bad to use them. I, it is worth keeping in mind that like, you know, they're these are these are not the end all be all, and and, and crafty players will try to trick you with them. But there's definitely a, a lot to be gained here, and I think it's worth delving into that. I find it to like I find it to do, be something that can help you win more. Definitely. I mean, the syncopate example is perfect, right? I mean, like perfect example. So we, we already touched into it just a second ago, but concealing your tells is also important. And we're, we're now getting into like, this is the real good stuff, the, the, the leveling part, because mm -hmm. le level one here is playing the game, right? You know, like, and, and, and not, uh, not worrying too much about tells all this much L level two, which we're trying to get to here is like taking that information and, and synthesizing it and getting probabilities and all that stuff. <laughs> what I what I think level three starts when you not only realize you're sending them information, but you try to send them fake information. Yes. And th there are like a lot of ways to do that. Bluffing definitely is part of that. And one of the things you, you, you have to remember when you bluff is it is good if you can to be consistent because let's say you, you uh, 
attack and bluff something, and they don't block. But let's say they then attack you back. Now they have mana up, so they're willing to take this, uh, make this uh, attack. They attack you back, and then you don't play anything into it. They might now think that you were bluffing when they attacked, and yeah. then so you might not want to try to run that bluff back. For example, you have, to, have to tell to, a consistent story. Yeah. Yes, you have to tell a consistent story. Uh, you also, when you, sometimes it can be worth passing up an opportunity to play a card where it would be good to make them think you don't have it. If you think you can get more value in the future, I have definitely had games where I could, you know, play my sweeper and take the like two for one or what have you. But instead I just don't play it and play another creature. Now it doesn't look that much like you have a sweeper yep. because you, you chose not to, to, to play a sweeper. Instead you played another creature, but you could just be setting them up for the long con. Right. Where now they're going to run their five drop into it. You gave up a two drop and a card, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> One of the things uh, p some folks have seen me do probably is if I'm winning a game by a lot, sometimes I will not play a card that would end the game because I think that I can uh, I, I can I can win the game without playing that card and showing that information. If it's a best of three, if it's a best of three, yes, not in a best of one. Yeah. Now that's that's a, that's an advanced maneuver and one that can sometimes backfire. So I definitely would uh, recommend you be careful with it. But it is something that I that I have done and uh, sometimes can really pay dividends because when you're playing against people who are good, and I usually try to think of my opponents as good. The more information you give them, the more the more of an advantage they'll have over the next couple of games as they try to use uh, that information to their benefit. So there's a lot of ways to send false signals, but as long as you're thinking about things in that term, it, as long as you realize that your opponent's uh, also a living, breathing opponent who is going to use the information you give them, you're on the right path. Because a lot of people don't think about it that way. And then they're shocked when you play around their card because it's like, no, you you played with that card face up for three turns. I, I am aware you have this card. Yes. And then when you're going to try to get me with it, don't be surprised when I have the bounce spell that I finally found and now I'm willing to walk into your card. Like – I mean, that, that's just another example. Your opponent doesn't play into something because they keep, you know, they, they they keep declining to block. And then one turn they block and you're like, aha, play my thing. It's like, yeah, now they have something. That's why they blocked all of a sudden. Right. And, and sometimes you're committed and you just have to do it. But be aware that, like, your opponent's also picking up what you're laying down. That You can't just go through the game assuming that you're the only one who's thinking about things. Right. And – you know, and, and that's really where things start to get super interesting with magic is when both players are on that level, right? And both players know what the others are capable of and not capable of. Because I think you'll see when newer players will get frustrated or surprised in the thinking that when they play against a better player, that they always have it, right? You hear that all the time. Oh, it's, it always has it, always has exactly what he needs. But if you actually watch the game, you'll see the patterns play out how you describe them, where the player declined to block for three turns in a row and then blocked when they did have it because they had the read. And it's like to the other player, if you're not thinking in those terms, it just feels like the, the opponent just always is doing the right thing, but they're probably giving up something significant to do it. And, you know, that does lead to a, a bigger conversation to just a, a point to make here, which is one skill that you can develop around these reads and stuff is just knowing when it's okay to give up some value in a game. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's correct to just say, okay, you got it. The cleanest example of this, and it's not even really giving up value in many scenarios, is when you put your opponent on a combat trick and then you block and then they have it and you go, good, no problem. My creature's gone. Your combat trick's gone. You used up some mana on your turn when you were supposed to be developing your board and I'm going to live with it. Right. Because you do have to make executive decisions sometimes around these reads because you will find yourself in situations somewhat frequently where you go, oh, well, if they have that, that's really bad for me. Well, what if I do this? No, that still doesn't work out. Well, what if I do this? No, nope, that still doesn't get you out of it. If they have that card, they're going to get you with it, period. And if that's the case, you have to be willing to say, I have my read, I'm walking into this, but I know it's not going to get any better than me walking into it, so I'm going to do it anyway, where a lot of people are stubborn or will just hold on forever, even though now the person's almost getting value from the card without even having to put it on the stack because you're playing around the thing that's in their hand and making them not even spend mana on it. And so, you know, make sure that when you do start to feel yourself getting better at this, 
and starting to pick up the reads that you're applying another layer of logic to understand when to actually follow them or when there really isn't a way out and you need to kind of brute force your way through. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me on the stream where I've realized that my opponent had a counter spell, but that I was in a losing position and couldn't afford to just sit here and do nothing turn after turn after turn playing around their counter spell. And I said, well, I'm going to run out of creature and they're going to counter it. And you know, chat's like, well, they're just going to counter it. It's like, yeah, they are. But then next turn I might actually be able to resolve something and get back in this game. Um, and even though I'll tell you, Luis, you get this type of power, right, where you can put a read on somebody and know what they have, and it doesn't feel good to play into it. You want to be the clever one who never plays into their counter spell, right? But you, you have to at some point or in some circumstances. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, the goal is not to not walk into their uh, cards. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, the goal is to win the game. And mm -hmm. sometimes those goals, you know, that sometimes those two things uh, clash and – you just have to know what, what, when to cut your losses and when to say like, hey, I'm at this point 95% sure they've got a syncopate in hand. But guess what? If they counter, if they have a counter for this sweeper, I'm dead. I have to cast the sweeper. I'm going to cast it. Oh, look, they syncopated it. Yeah. But you know what? Sometimes you were wrong earlier and they don't have it. Sometimes, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in a case where it's not so clear cut, they re don't realize that they can destroy you with a card or they don't cast it or, or whatever. A lot of things can happen. But at the end of the day, you're trying to make the best decision you can. Sometimes that decision is to play into things you think they have because you don't really have a choice. The, the classic example is the Wrath of God example, right? This is yep. like the, the, the seminal learning example where it's like yep. you're playing an aggro deck. You think your opponent has Wrath, so you don't play your last two creatures. They then – proceed to use one for one removal and win the game and, yep. and it's like well guess what if you had played those two creatures you would have won and and it's like hey but i wanted to play around wrath it's like you weren't beating a wrath if right. they wrathed your five creatures and you had two two ones in your hand they're not going to lose but if you played those extra two ones and then they had three spot removal spells maybe they'd still lose so yeah you play around wrath unless you can't beat it in which case they no longer have it it's not even something in, in you know in, in your mind at all and right Knowing when not to play around things goes hand in hand with trying to predict what they have. Right. And, you know, magic has a lot of room, right? Like it's actually not that common that you're just forced to to play right into the thing that they have. Many, many, most of the time you can find a way to augment your play, to choose different lines of play that can play around the thing or mitigate it. And, you know, of course it's much better to know about it. You know, it doesn't really feel better in the moment to say, well, they had the wrath and I knew it and then I lost. I still lost. But uh, I'll tell you what, if you are aware of these things and can give yourself the chance to play around them, your win percentage is going to be much, much higher than somebody who's just like, you know, spamming cards onto the battlefield and hoping nothing goes wrong. So, Well, I, I, I love this topic. Uh, this is, you know, the, the sort of thing I love about magic. And it's one of the most fun things about magic is figuring out what your opponent could have and why. And mm -hmm. that is the sort of thing. The more you practice at it, the better you'll get at it. And at some point, you won't even have to actively think about this. This also dovetails nicely with one of the other things I love about magic, which is intuition, which is you get to the point where you think, oh, they've got a sweeper. And you don't even have to know exactly why you think that, but then if you kind of broke it down, you'd see, but your, your mind's already good at pattern recognition. Humans are great at pattern recognition. It's a good survival instinct. Amazing. And, yep. And, you, you know, our, 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 our brains have been trained to do this. So once you start picking up some patterns and playing a lot, your brain will take it from there. And that's a, a topic for another show. And we've in fact done many shows on it, but uh, th it goes hand in hand. And that's why this is one of the, one of the things I love most about the game. Yep. I think to me, to sum it up, um, you know, you want to try to combine that intuitive knowledge that you get from playing a lot of a format where you see the play patterns and you see the stuff coming with that metal gear sound exclamation point moment where you go, something's different. And now you take the moment to do all the things that we just described in this episode about how to figure out what could be going on, how to narrow it down, and then how to play around or adjust your play to the thing. Don't ignore that red light in the back of your head that starts spinning and making sounds where you're like, wait a minute, what? this is weird. I've played a lot of the format and people don't normally do this. And then uh, proceed accordingly and you'll see a nice bump. Plus, I agree with Luis. This is one of the best things about the game. This is why I like commentating the game because when these moments come up on camera where both players know what's up and they're both, you know, this is part of the reason why 
uh, you know, the announcement about the pro play thing was so sad because I think we're still going to have competitive magic. I think we're still going to have tournaments that people want to win. So it's not like that disappears. But I'll tell you, you cannot substitute, at least in my commentary career, you know, high level, like day, late day two or top eight of a pro tour. You, you know, if you go to a random GP, you know, late in day one, yeah, there's some pretty good players, right? I mean, better than most players in the world in many scenarios. It is not the same thing as when you get two full-time, you know, tenured pros, if you will, going at it um, for the highest stakes. It's a different game. If you watch Louis and Huey play, uh, it is just not the same thing as if you watch the best player in your area play against the other best player in your area or two people that won GPs or something like that. Uh, and this, this is like kind of the meaty core of all of that, which is, I know, you know, stuff, and we both know that about each other. And how are we going to adjust to, to each other's level of knowledge as a listener of this show? If you can master this stuff, it's like giving you Excalibur because it's sending you into the masses of people who play on arena who don't listen to the show or are just playing, you know, trying to do their best, but aren't really into it at the level that you are as a listener of the show and you can slaughter people. I mean, you just, you know, things that they don't. And that is all, you know, that's kind of it for magic. So that's the hope of the, of this episode is to get you to that point. Um, let's call it a show, Luis. We Let's forgot do to do a crack a pack, but I think we could just skip it. I'm taking I expressive we'll iteration. <laughs> hey, okay, how, how about this? I'll distill it down. Do you want expressive iteration or baleful mastery? Uh, I, w- I would take baleful mastery, I think. An act of cowardice. I would take expressive iteration. And after I 3-0 with uh-huh. the other teamer deck, you'll be right there with me. Okay, there we All go. Right. There we go. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for this one. Thanks for listening. We always appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us every week. Uh, if you want to find us on social media, you can say hi, ask questions, whatever. I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. And uh, you can find really everything you need about the podcast over at LRcast.com. That has links on the front page to all of the stuff that we do as well as a uh, uh, post for every episode of the show ever. You can download it. You can stream it from the site, um, uh, you know, even going back years and years and years and, uh, you know, sometimes old sets pop up. You can listen to this set review or the sunset show and get an idea for what's going on with those before you jump in that kind of thing all over at LRcast.com. And of course, don't forget about ch- uh, channel fireball. You want to make sure you check them out for really anything that you need. I mentioned the adventures in the forgotten realms. That's by the way, the dungeons and dragons set that's coming out in lieu of a core set this summer. Um, and the spoiler cards for that are starting to come out too. So that's going to get kind of cool. Um, but like I said, you can get a draft booster crate on pre-order for one thirty four ninety nine right now. And of course the pre-orders will develop further as that goes along. Um, and then also make sure that you check out CFB pro. Uh, that's one of the ways that you can level up your game. You know, if this is the type of episode that really sings to you, the level ups that we do, you know, um, there's a lot more of that at CFB pro. If you do pick up anything over there, make sure you use the affiliate code LR at checkout. It helps out the show and we appreciate it. That's going to do it for this one. Thanks so much for hanging out. We'll see you next week. I have uh, exciting news to share. Oh, what uh, do you got? Some good friends of ours just came out with a game. Uh, We've got Storybook Brawl is a game. It's uh, that the, the three primary developers on it are Matt Nass, Raptor, Josh Hunter Layton. Those are the same person, by the way. <laughs> <Raptor's> <laughs> his name, and uh, Matt Place. And uh, I bet a lot of listeners won't know Matt Place. He he's a fantastic game developer. He he was a um, the he was my boss at Direwolf for quite some time. I learned a ton about game design from him. And uh, he used to work at Wizards. He was also a, a Pro Tour champion, though. You know, at this point, unfortunately, most people don't know that. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but mm-hmm. he, he he won a Rochester Draft Pro Tour. That's where you draft all face up. So it's an ancient format. But uh, no, Matt's that a great guy. That was in 1997. Yes. He, he also <laughs> won Teams Worlds in 1996, which was, by the way, yeah. the same year that the Pro Tour came out. <laughs> yeah, no, he, old school player for sure. Yeah. But anyways, th- th- those three guys, along with some other folks, uh, they made Storybook Brawl. And I am really into this game and i'm not just saying that because they're my friends uh you know because i i have played a lot of hours of this game 
And uh, it's an auto battler. So you, if you've heard me talk about Hearthstone Battlegrounds before, you know I already like auto battlers. It's uh, set in like a storybook fantasy setting. So they have a lot of very cool tropes in there. Like they have, uh, you know, like Humpty Dumpty, for example. He's a he's a very cheap big unit that, uh, but when he dies, he do, he can't be put back together again. He dies permanently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's cute, just, it, cute. It, it tells a bunch of great stories, but it's also pretty punny. Like they have a uh, Snow White. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, she like levels up if you buy seven dwarves. But OK, you look at the art and she's a monster. She's actually undead. It's because she's snow white, as in W.I.G.H.T., which is oh, an undead fun. monster. Cool. That's fun. <laughs> so the game is the game is a ton of fun. Uh, you can download it on Steam. Just look for Storybook Brawl or to go go to their Twitter, which is just at Story, Storybook Brawl. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's free to download and free to play. And that, that's one of the cool things about uh, games these days and, and ways you can make them is it is free to download the game, completely free to play it. You get access to about half the heroes and exactly half of the of the heroes for free. And then you can earn the other ones by playing more or, or you can buy them. But mm-hmm. you're not at a huge disadvantage if you don't buy any of the heroes or you don't have any of the heroes because you're always going to have a choice between two free heroes and two of the ones you have to unlock. And they did not, you know, they are good game designers. They did not put all the good heroes behind a paywall. That's not how it works. So I, I would highly recommend checking it out. They also have a Discord, you, which you can find if you download the game. There's the links right on the front page of the game. And I, I probably put 25 hours into the game over the last week or something like that. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. You like buy your units. You, you discover treasures. It's basically like for Magic fans – it's like we all drafted decks, but instead of playing them out, the computer automatically played them out, and then you get to draft again. It's so it's kind of perfect. Like you, you know, instead of you know, you can just sit down and, and just force your terrible teamer decks and let the computer d- determine how many wins you get. <laughs> we you got one seven zero, buddy. We're a three zero away from proof. <laughs> uh, oh no! Real quick, but, uh, though, is this game fun or is it like a in depth? You know, like what? Is this like a quick thing while I'm in line at the store type game or is this like a more magic-y thing where I'm like, you know, I, I really want to go deep with this and understand it and stuff? Like where does it fall on that kind of scale? Uh, well, I, I, I first of all would object to categorizing games as, as fun versus in-depth, but uh, I know well, it's not exactly I, what you I, mean. I do put them on that. I think- yeah, I, I don't I think know. Ca- casual is maybe a better way to describe that. Okay, I, fair I, enough. <laughs> but, is, uh, it ca- is it casual or serious? What's the other end of casual? So anyway. it, it's not on mobile yet. And um, they said it's going to come like end of the year or something like that is what they're targeting. But uh, a game takes about – if you if you make it to the finals, it takes about like 25 minutes or so. If okay. you lose earlier, it can be a little shorter than that. Um you don't have to like, first of all, now's a good time to get into it because everyone, it just, you know, early, you know, the open beta just started on Friday. So mm-hmm. everyone's kind of learning the, you know, and figuring out what's going on in the game. Like you're not going to just get crushed or whatever. Right. And s- second, uh, there is depth to the game, but it, it's not one that takes an incredible amount of time to like get competent. And it, it's, it's, it's like a lot of the best games. It's not that hard to learn, mm-hmm. but once you get into it, you realize there's a lot of a, a lot of hidden depth, oh, which I think perfect. Yeah. That, that's that's the perfect thing. So, uh, you know, I really love the game. Um, I, I'm not involved in making it. I, I, I again, I you know, I, I, I'm always very uh, cognizant of disclosing when when I'm like getting paid to promote something. In this case, I am not. Uh, but I, I think it's a it's a ton of fun, and it's made by some good friends of mine. So I do want to support them. You know, I, I really I really would love to see this game take off, and I know that I'm having a blast playing it. And you know, if you want to try it out, maybe you'll enjoy it too. So that's a storybook brawl. And again, just searching for it on Steam or going to their Twitter seems like the best place to get a hold of it right now. And it's free to download. So check it out. <laughs> 